welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us today for a uh, social innovation seminar series. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I know people will pop in and, and Stacia will, will admit them when they come, but we have only an hour and I want to make sure we get as much time as possible uh, to hear from, from Matthew Grimes. I'm really delighted that, that Matthew agreed to, to join us today. Um, I've known him for quite a while now. He started his career at University of Alberta, then he went to Indiana, and he's now in his finishing his third year at Cambridge um, uh, and is co-director of the Entrepreneurship Center there, a uh, scholar of organizational theory, um, and does a lot of really wonderful work around B corporations, around uh, platforms, sort of social entrepreneurship, sort of the the the. Uh, interested in social change, um, um, broadly speaking, and, and it's just, you know, always a big fan of his work. So I'm really glad that he could join us today. He's going to talk about impact investing uh, in, uh, and uh, social change and all sorts of other things that I'll let him tell you about. But um, thank you very much for joining us, and I'm really looking forward to hearing what you're working on. Thanks, Christine. So typically, I'd, I'd start by, you know, locating, trying to locate this paper amidst uh, you know, some of my other work, but I think Christine's done a decent job of sort of, you know, giving you some, some perspective on the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And so hopefully it'll make sense how this all fits in. Um, if, if anybody would like to converse about my other work, we could do that at a different time, but if we've got an hour, um, I, I think I'll just probably jump right into talking about this particular paper, um, primarily because I'd love to get everybody's feedback as well. So, um, this, this is a paper that is working its way through the review process for at, at AMJ, the Academy Management Journal, um, and their special issue that is all about engaging public conversations. Um, so the, the, the idea is trying to bridge the world of theory and the world of practice in some way. And, you know, one of the things that we're trying to argue in this paper is that, is that there's this really large public conversation happening around the, the idea of hype. And it's and it's been persistent. And and the other thing, I mean, so I just did a news search. This was actually a few days prior to Christmas when I did this search. I was just looking and, and it's just, you know, series, of, you know, just page after page of news articles published in the last several days at that point, you know, that had invoked hype in the title of the article. So it's clear that it's clear that the world is concerned about hype, but both in terms of its positive and potential negative effects. And, and you know, we can see this kind of somewhat clearly as we look at various kinds of scandals. Um, so startups like Theranos um, and this other, you know, this uh, organization Candy is a Chinese, Chinese company as well. I mean, you know, I think at this point everybody knows the story of of Theranos. But you know, why why do why do scandals like this happen? Well, you know, one of the things that I, I think may be happening is that as new ventures engage with hype, it it tends to elevate expectations for new ventures and their founders. And so, what happens? Right, these founders occasionally resort to fraud as a way to try to manage that hype, and and of course, like in the context of social innovation, I don't, you know, we might we might think, oh well, you know, that happens in the that happens in the commercial sector. But as as soon as we start talking about social innovation, well, we'll we'll get past the hype. But I think that that's certainly not the case. You know, this context of social innovation is no stranger to hype, and I'm I'm sure most of you would would agree and be aware of that that these kinds of the conversations and the elevated expectations around social programs and social initiatives tend to um, tend to become, you know, elevate very quickly. And this has dramatic consequences, both for the sector and also and also the the potential impact that we might have on beneficiaries. And so there's a, there there are real questions that I think we need to wrestle with as organizational theorists about the, the the promise and the challenges associated with hype, you know, and, and so I guess hopefully I've convinced you that hype really matters, and not only that, but also that it's 
it's kind of everywhere in the news. Um, we hear a lot about it. it, and its implications are hugely important. And yet, I also think, you know, our perspective on this is that very little has been discussed in the management literature about this concept of hype and its implications and how firms deal with it. And so all of these different questions remain that you can see here. You know, what is it? How does it differ from peripheral concepts? How do firms and new ventures benefit from it? How are they challenged by it? And how might firms differ in terms of how they attempt to mobilize that hype? Um, and, you know, but it's worth, it's worth also thinking about outside the management literature, you know, even if we, even if we move outside that literature, there's, there's kind of little that we have to go on here. I think hype, hype often gets discussed as, you know, economists will sometimes ref, invoke the concept in thinking about asset inflation and market bubbles, um, you know, uh, uh, social scientists that study techno technological adoption sort of see hype as kind of the cyclical or even evolutionary model uh, that is almost almost kind of an attribute of the technology itself. And then there's this kind of there's a sociology of expectations as well that I think is that I think is important and and clearly this is something that we want to link to in this paper. Uh, that is about, you know, essentially getting at the idea that hype refers to these kinds of claimed possibilities, which provide some kind of direction to search processes, you know, and, and specifically, they usually invoke this idea in the context of science and technology, but again, often resulting in kind of overinflated expectations. And I think a lot of people think about when, when technologists think about the notion of hype, very quickly, we, we think about the, the Gardner models around hype cycles. Um, some of you might be familiar with Gardner and the work they do in sort of projecting, uh, you know, some sort of foresight around the evolution of various technologies. Um, I actually, prior to, uh, prior to, you know, returning to academia, I, I was a consultant at this company called CEB, which is um, based out of Washington, D.C., for several years, and uh, I worked a lot with C chief information officers while I was there. And I was always, you know, as as these CIOs were making requests of our organization, they would always ask about new technologies, whether it was the right time to adopt a certain technology. And and you know, we we would we would always kind of point to these Gardner models. So I was very familiar with how Gardner was thinking about. Where, where on these trajectories do different technologies fall? But, but I, you know, uh, my, my colleague and I, uh, I should have mentioned as well, um, actually, I'm going to go back and mention this um, because it's important to do so. So, by the way, this research was funded by the Australian Research Council and uh, my excellent uh, co-author, Daniel Lowe from the University of Technology in Sydney, um, and I are working on this paper. But um, so, you know, as, as Danielle and I were, were thinking about this problem and, and we're thinking about these kind of, you know, the public conversations around hype, we think that this depiction of hype kind of misses quite a bit. Oh, and actually just let me just pause one, another sidebar here. If anybody has any questions or, or comments, please, please do feel free to, to interrupt me. Um, I'll, I'll actually pull up the chat function as well and just have that off to the side. So if you're interested in typing in your question, you can feel free to do so. Or alternatively, you can raise your raise your virtual hand and uh, we can we can do it that way. Um, but yeah, feel free to interrupt with any questions. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in your feedback and thoughts. So our, our thought here is that a lot these models of hype miss quite a bit. Most importantly, I think we we believe it misses on the fact that Hype is not actually an attribute of the technology itself, but rather a feature of our current culture and how we tend to collectively pay attention to and discuss anything that is new and seems kind of promising. And um, so, but I guess this begs the question, you know, what, what is it precisely? And so we, we try to offer a more precise definition of hype. And my guess is that this is actually going to change over the next few weeks and months as we revise the article, uh, according to what reviewers have asked of us. But um, how we're defining it 
at present is really in terms of this kind of compounding acceleration of positive culturally based discourse and attention around, for example, an idea, actor, object, or solution. Um, and you know, whenever there, there's always a challenge that I I feel I face, like when I try to introduce some kind of new concept into the management literature, very quickly reviewers are like, okay, well, how does this differ from all of these other concepts? And I think that's very important to do, right? It's important to somehow distinguish why, why can't we explain what is happening with respect to hype as it relates to concepts like legitimacy or concepts like celebrity or concepts like fads and fashions and even rumors. Um, you know, so all of these are clearly of some degree of relevance in as we think about the notion of hype, right? I mean, it's not, it's not that this literature has completely ignored this understanding of kind of, you know, a cultural, uh, the, the kind of ways in which collective visions become a cultural resource, but also a cultural liability. But I think one of the things that we're trying to do here is to distinguish this vis-a-vis -vis legitimacy, for example, where legitimacy conveys a kind of a taken for grantedness. There's a, there's a sort of a threshold at which an object becomes legitimate and therefore unquestioned. And whereas hype, as you can see from the articles that I presented very early on, there's, there's, a, there's a desire in a lot of ways to be a part of hype, but there's always a precarity to it, right? Where individuals are constantly questioning the, the, to what extent is this just hype? Or is, this, is there something real here? And, um, and then also as it relates to these, these issues of management fads and fashions, I guess one of, the thing, one of the ways that we're trying to distinguish it here is by saying that, you know, by making the claim that management fashions and fashions and its byproducts are necessarily temporary. There's an idea that, you know, if you were to go back to the, for example, the Gardner hype cycle, that a fad is always going to wax and wane, and then it's going to end. And then a new fad will emerge, or a new fashion will emerge. Um, but, but here, there's, there's an assumption in the context of hype that, that some, of these, some of these technologies, as it were, or some of these innovations, as it were, will, will ultimately move past this kind of, you know, hype and, and ultimately arrive at some place uh, of, of legitimacy, of the taken for grantedness. So there's a, you know, their hype and its byproducts can ultimately follow a pathway toward demise or toward legitimacy. And, and, and ultimately, I think that there's something, there's something about hype that deserves particular attention above and beyond a lot of these other concepts that we're used to studying within the field of management. So um, with that in mind, uh, by the way, if, again, if there are any questions, again, feel free to interrupt. Um, but, but ultimately, but beyond describing what it is in this paper, what we're trying to do is set up why we believe it's interesting to study this. So to, to us, hype is really one of the most interesting cultural features that we could possibly study because it has such large and significant benefits and challenges for organizations and entrepreneurs. Um, you know, on the one hand, for example, if we think about these, you know, these technologies at the front of Gardner's hype cycle, well, clearly they're they're able to ride the wave of elevated expectations. If you're a new venture in any one of these areas, you're clearly going to benefit from the increased expectations that people have for these technologies. Investors are rushing in to get a piece of these new markets. And so you, what you see is that resources become quite abundant. But then soon thereafter, hype becomes this, you know, uh, important cultural liability. The elevated expectations become inflated and it's nearly impossible to, to, for organizations to deliver against those expectations. And so ultimately, you know, you come back to, to this kind of, model here in, in that world of overinflated expectations. This is where you have these instances of fraud occur 
as new ventures attempt to essentially manage the hype by way of potentially, you know, deceiving various stakeholders in the public. So ultimately, our research question is interested in understanding how you convert hype into some kind of sustained opportunity. And specifically, we're interested in how they convert hype into a sustained opportunity to create some sort of social impact. And I'll come back to this idea of social impact a little bit later when I start discussing the methods of the paper. Um, but I, I wanna just take a brief moment for you know, any of the academics that are on the call to, to you know, essentially situate, try to situate this research question in, into you know, the management scholarship and the existing conversations that we've been having as a field around notions of entrepreneurship and opportunities and, and how you build infrastructure around those kinds of opportunities. So um, ultimately, you know, we, we were originally thinking as the, the, the recent body of literature on cultural entrepreneurship could be best suited to helping explore this question. Um, again, as I noted, this paper is currently kind of in a messy process of deconstructing. And so we're, it, it's likely that we're gonna shift away from this literature uh, given how the reviewers are pushing us. But um, I did want to just kind of present the, the architecture for how we were originally thinking about this um, in terms of cultural entrepreneurship. So as you think about this literature, it's largely, it's largely been concerned with idea stage entrepreneurship, where entrepreneurs are engaging with culture and making use of cultural resources. And why are they doing that? Well, they're doing that in order to attract attention and acquire resources from various stakeholders. A lot of it is, is it focuses on communication and particularly narratives as a form of communication um, and the extent to which those narratives are, are seen to resonate with stakeholders. Um, but the problem is that even to the extent that a, a narrative might resonate with stakeholders, it is also likely to elevate stakeholder expectations. And, and what we're claiming is that there's, there's good reason to suspect that hype amplifies both of these things simultaneously, right? It amplifies the degree to which a, a, a particular story is likely to resonate with an audience, but it's also going to elevate stakeholder expectations along with that. Um, Christine, I see your comment. It's long. Do you do you want to come on and ask your question, or is this? I don't. I don't want to distract you too much. I just wanted to make sure that you you knew about David Kirsch and Brent Goldfarb's book about bubbles and crashes, because uh, because they talk a lot about the role of narratives in constructing bubbles. Um, and, uh, you know, so, I, and so I, the question was really, is this, how is hype different from bubbles? Uh, but mostly I just want to make sure you know about David and Brent's work because it feels really related yeah. to what you're talking about. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank, thank you. I mean, I, I certainly know their, their work uh, well, and this is a good, this is a good reminder that um, we need to be, we need to be engaging this more closely. Um, I, I mean, I, yeah, so, so it does, you know, I touched on this a little bit, but I think um, you know, I guess I, I would also be interested to, you know, because these are the questions as well that reviewers are, are concerned with, you know, as we think about, for example, how does it differ from, uh, from related concepts like fads and fashions, but also bubbles, um, you know, and, and I think, you know, I, I mentioned here that there's some conversation about economic asset and market bubbles that, that are, uh, but, but I think my, my, my sense here is, and you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts on whether this is off base, but you know, it, it strikes me that there is a way in which this is, um, these market bubbles are more about fads um, and it, well, and also to some extent overinflated expectations, but um, there's, so there's this waxing and waning effect, but here what we're talking about is the the emergence of that, um, and also I think that that there's a way in which these market bubbles are are being ascribed to, you know, a an, um, 
well to the markets to the markets as opposed to the you know the cult the, the sort of the culture around these these uh, inflated expectations. Dan, you have your your hand up. Maybe you have thoughts on this. I too don't want to slow you down, but uh, it, it it's sort of related to this, and maybe you'll get to this. So you know, feel free to say I'll get to it. But it relates to in part how um, you know time in the future is treated, right? Uh, and that might be mm. differentiating some of these different concepts. And so uh, my kind of specific question had to do with, well, how do, does one, you mentioned fraud, right? Um, mm. And in some ways one would say, well, fraud is malintent, right? With regards to hype maybe, um, mm. but hype and uh, fraud in some ways are hard to distinguish in the moment, right? These are also, ex post concepts that are easier. Right. So that, you know, just to throw that out there and there's a quality to all of these phenomena that is about retrospection that comes to define a behavior uh, rather than yes. in the moment. And I don't know if you're dealing with that aspect of the theoretical, but, but, but one of the yeah. things about the cultural entrepreneurship stuff, at least to my understanding of it, it doesn't really deal so explicitly with these temporal dynamics. So I don't know if you right. Yeah, yeah. I think that's right, and and I guess you know, and we're trying to get around that a little bit with this definition that there's that if we can define hype as this kind of compounding, rapid exponential in terms of the the culturally based discourse, the what we're suggesting is that that th- that in itself becomes a, a point of vulnerability and a liability. As as you see this rapidly advancing, you can you can actually uh, capture it um, in the moment, as opposed to sort of only only post hoc defining it as something that that occurred. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, your your point is very well taken. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And and that I think applies to market bubbles as well. Like we we can define a market bubble post hoc, yeah. um, or but we can or we can have some conjecture about. The possibility that 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 this is a that this is a bubble. Yes. Um, but yeah, yeah. Good, great thoughts, Dan. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, Takanori, did you did you want to raise your question? Come on, Mike, and raise your question. Oh uh, yeah. Um. um uh, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, I'm very curious to know whether you know phenomenon of hype is kind of uh, happened by structural factors. Say, you know, there is a very competitive environment. So you know, if you know your rival you know, uh, uh, make some, you know, uh, like a yeah, hype and then you have to do, or it's more like a personal traits, you know, like psychological traits of entrepreneurs. I, I think it's kind of mixed, but, you know, interact with each other. But do you think uh, like there is a, any like a dominated like factors why, you know, hype happens? So that's my question. So I'm, I'm not sure I have a, a great answer here, but I mean, I, I think that there is, there's an extent to which, I mean, it, you know, our definition is presupposing that there's some kind of mimetic force at play, where um, you know, essentially, there's a there's network aspects um, mm-hmm. as as this relation the the kind of co- the conversation compounds on itself, and therefore it's both it, there's a relational dynamic and also a cultural dynamic, as as more and more people are talking about it, then we're likely to see that the rate of conversation continue to grow exponentially. Um, and so, uh, yes, I mean, I think that, that, that has a, that has consequences for the psychological and the structural as well. But, but I think it's, you know, reducing it to one or the other, uh, is probably problematic. I, I think it's, um, but, but I do think it's grounded in culture, um, is at least how we're, how we're situating it right now. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that all of these conversations about the definition of hype is clearly is clearly important because we we invoke the term so commonly in in our public conversations, but there's not a lot of there's not a lot of real grounding of this idea within within the scholarly literature, at least that I'm aware of. Um, and and I mean, the, the, I think the closest to it that I've seen. Is this kind of sociology of expectations, which really tries to tries to get at the um, the nature of you know 
the, the evolving nature of expectations. Okay, so beyond the cultural entrepreneurship literature, I think that the literature doesn't offer much insight into how organizations might navigate this particular tension that I, that I noted where hype is both amplifying the potential for cultural resonance, but also amplifying the expectations that come alongside that. And so, you know, what we try to do in this paper is bring in a secondary literature that we felt might offer some starting points for theorizing about the process that organizations and entrepreneurs might use to convert hype into a sustained opportunity. And again, I think we're, you know, I'll just uh, foreshadow this by, by saying, I, you know, I, we've, we've been deconstructing our literature or, or in, within which we're framing this paper. And so I think that some of this is also gonna, gonna be shifted to the periphery as well. But, but I think ultimately what we're trying to get at here by invoking this literature on institutional infrastructure is that the work that the work that these organizations are doing to it, relationally and in terms of, of governance around those relationships is critically important. And this is how we see the institutional infrastructure literature helping in this regard. But again, I think uh, you know we're, we're having we're feeling some some push to move past this research. But it, but this this work. Um, largely is, is thinking about the cultural, structural, and relational foundations that shape and guide exchange. And these foundations ultimately give rise to and help maintain the stability of the social environment. And so we think that this literature on institutional infrastructure can help provide some scaffolding to, to uh, or, or some insight into helping understand the process by which entrepreneurs navigate the, the both the the cultural resource and the cultural liability that is hype. Now let's turn to the context here. Um, as I noted earlier, we're specifically interested in understanding how firms convert hype into a sustained opportunity for social impact. And by social impact, I'm referring to outcomes that enhance society's performance in terms of social and environmental problems. Um, and one of the areas where we're seeing the most hype around potential social impact, and I'm sure you all, if you're on this call, you're probably familiar with this, is, is in the area of impact investing. Um, and impact investing is essentially a blend of traditional financially motivated investments and philanthropic grant making. Um, this is where the expected financial return and the expected impact on society are both seen as high, where essentially you might expect near market, market rate returns on your investments, but also some kind of evidence-based impact. And you can see a lot of this hype um, reflected in these quotes here. I mean, at the, in the World Economic Forum report, JP Morgan and Rockefeller Foundation collaborated on this seminal report in 2010 which claimed that the impact investment sector could reach a trillion dollars by 2020. And then there's a tremendous amount of buzz that has been generated out around this term of impact investing. Um, in the next quote, we certainly know how to talk about this subject and we can even throw some good parties, but will we be able to turn all this conferencing into the asset class that JP Morgan and Rockefeller Foundation described in their report? Can we live up to our name and have a real impact? There's a real danger of overhyping the sector. Um, the final quote, we're making sure that there's a little bit of a moderating voice, hopefully getting ahead of the potential hype or bubble. So again, there's, there's some idea that hype can, hype can be managed. So it's, not, it's, a, it's a potential resource motivating all of the activity, but it's also a liability. And uh, Christine, there, there's another there's another notion of the bubble right there. So it's clear that we need to be we need to be careful here um, about about situating this um, appropriately as it relates to uh, that concept. Um, so around 2010 through 2013, one of the big points of discussion 
within the impact investing community was about the possibility of building a stock exchange that would focus on impact investing and make the financing of social enterprises more effective and efficient. So around that time, the hype of impact investing was was essentially culminating in this, this attention toward these kinds of social stock exchanges. And so the idea is that the idea behind this this kind of form of the social stock exchange is basically to connect all of the parties that you see here through some kind of rigorous platform. And the first three social stock exchanges around the world um, that that were launched at that time, almost almost at the same exact time, which made it a really interesting kind of uh, potential a uh, qualitative study to compare across these ventures, um, they're, they're here on the right. And these are also the three cases in our study. And so they all, they all had ambitions to engage this kind of space around social stock exchanges. Um, and, and they, at the time they, at, you know, in the pre-model, as we looked at like their pre-business model, there was a lot of similarities. I mean, they all were trying to do essentially the same kind of thing. Um, and they all were operating in a regulatory regulatory environment that was largely liberalized uh, financial fi- a liberalized financial economy. Um, and so we felt like you know this was going to be interesting to 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 sort of trace these organizations over time. When we initially set out to study these three cases, we weren't actually sure whether we were going to observe, more similarities across the cases or more differences between those cases. And so, you know, we, we thought, well, either way, this, this will be interesting to observe, you know, how are they building this kind of field together? Or if they, if they diverge over time, well, how do they, you know, wh- what, what matters to, those, to that divergence and, and how does that result in different outcomes? And quickly, that became clear that despite some of the initial similarities we were seeing, um, we we also began to see these differences in how the businesses evolved and ultimately how they fulfilled or did not fulfill the initial hype. And this related both in terms of, in, in two like really key ways, both in terms of the business models um, that they were that they were developing but also in their approach to impact measurement. So as we started to observe these differences, we we began to orient our data collection to try to understand these different outcomes. Um, You know, as as you can see, I mean, London ultimately ceased their operations. Toronto became this kind of fully accredited financial broker and was, was ultimately engaging kind of in, I mean, in a sort of moderated version of what they had what they had intended to create in the first place, but they were just growing it, growing it systematically. And then on the other hand, Singapore started kind of shifting into a, a very different direction and sort of downplaying the whole notion of a social stock exchange. So there was a clear kind of pivoting effort that went on here, um, efforts to kind of grow the initial vision here and, and a ceasing of operations in the London case. And, and so, you know, given all of these distinct differences in terms of outcomes, we, we wanted to try to under, unpack why we, saw, we observed these differences. Um, in terms of data collection, our, our data involved, you know, both, uh, well, it involved non-participant observation, involved interviews, and it involved a lot of documentation um, as, as has become sort of traditionally expected within qualitative research in our field. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump into the findings here um, unless there are additional questions at this point about you know, this context that we're trying to, we're trying to study um, or in, in how we're tying in these notions of hype um, with the literature on cultural entrepreneurship or institutional infrastructure. Any, any questions at this point in time? Um, okay. Again, feel free to feel free to jump in if, in, if you if you do have any questions. Um, 
So I'm going to show you the theoretical model first and, and then explain, and I'm going to try to explain what we found at a high level. And then I'll just, I'll go into some of the details and provide some quote-based evidence just to help show you some of these dynamics in more detail. But when I, when I present qualitative work, I tend to like to start high level just so I can orient you to, to what we're, what we're theorizing. So first, as, as noted earlier, hype can, can be seen as both a cultural resource and a cultural liability. And what we observed is that these resources were initially amplified, but then declined over time. And that was largely a function of the decay in engagement. So stakeholders ultimately became, you know, they were incredibly engaged initially, but less engaged over time. Um, and then simultaneously, we observed that the cultural liability was most clearly evident as stakeholders' expectations grew rapidly and became inflated. So the liability is related to this expectation growth, whereas the resources were related to this engagement decay. And the process for how the new ventures navigated the hype tends to look like the following. So the first step in this process is what we've referred to as hype mobilization, which, by which we're essentially referring to these practices that try to translate the kind of global and abstract cultural momentum into some specific context. So there's a, there's a sort of a translation effort that happens where you're taking these abstract and global ideas and shifting it into a kind of a local context and trying to make it specific. Um, it, it's essentially how the, the new venture seeks to attach itself to the hype thereby converting the cultural resources into financial res resources and related how they seek to manage any expectations initially. Okay, the second step is how they seek to organize around that hype. So this is really where the hard work and strategy comes into play. You know, what is the platform going to look like? What types of governance are you going to put into place? How are you going to facilitate the connections across the platform and within the ecosystem, right? And so, you know, we're defining platform organizing as these practices that seek to address the key technological and informational requirements to increase participation and govern exchange within these multi-sided and technology, technologically bounded marketplaces. So when we think about organizing a platform, you know, at least as, as I've thought about this, this concept, it feels to me like there's a lot of effort that goes into um, the, the, the technological and informational requirements and how you're governing exchange, but also increasing participation. On, on the other hand, there's also efforts to organize the ecosystem. And here, what we're referring to are the pr practices de designed to develop and govern broader field activity um, in this potential market, such as local network restructuring and positioning and constructing and policing field boundaries. Okay, so, you know, here what we're referring to, basically what we're suggesting here is that how hype is mobilized affects new ventures entrepreneurial runways. And, I'm sure most of you have heard this concept of entrepreneurial runways before. Now, typically when entrepreneurs use the term, they're referring to essentially their cash burn rate, right? How much money the venture has in the bank and how quickly the venture is, you know, cruising along that runway as they're spending money each month. But in this paper, we're suggesting that this kind of more financial definition of an entrepreneurial runway actually misses out on what is actually the scarce resource that entrepreneurs are having to manage in the context of new venture creation. What we're claiming here is that the scarce resource for new ventures is, is not money, but rather stakeholder engagement. If a, new, you know, if a new venture is in need of additional money, there's going to be no shortage of investment um, 
that those ventures can solicit as long as stakeholders remain heavily engaged. However, such sustained stakeholder engagement is often contingent on the venture's capacity to provide you know, clear evidence of their impact toward their original goals. So, so ultimately, we're, we're thinking of this kind of flexibility as a kind of entrepreneurial discretion or a sort of a, a relational affordance, right? There's the, the relationships that, that these entrepreneurs have built through this second step in the process and also in how they mobilize the hype provides some degree of relational affordances, both in terms of the flexibility with which the entrepreneurs have to demonstrate clear, clear impact, right? The length of time to demonstrate evidence before stakeholder engagement um, starts to decay. But then also in terms of the flexibility that the entrepreneurs experience in terms of shifting their business model around. To what extent is there a leeway um, that, that the venture is experiencing in order to pivot its business model while still accommodating stakeholder expectations? Um, any, any comments or questions up till now on these elements of the model? I really like what you're trying to do, kind of trying to get at the micro level questions about how uh, new ventures navigate this, um, and particularly around this idea of stakeholder engagement and managing it. Um, what I'm wondering is, you mentioned narratives before as yeah. the form in which this takes place. To me, yeah. that seems a, a crucial element of the actual communicative form that this takes. Mm. And yeah, yeah. it seems like you want to stay away from it. Could you give us a little context? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, th thank you for your comments. Um, yeah. In part, this is why I think we're moving. We're going to, we're going to shift away from the cultural entrepreneurship literature as a, as a framing device for this paper, because um, it's true. Our data, our data really doesn't, take the form of narratives. It, we're, we're much more focused on the actual kinds of, you know, relational and material efforts that are, that are happening within that work than we are in the narratives. I mean, I think that to some extent that the hype mobilization is where we start to see the kind of the narrative work in order to kind of locate these, you know, tr translate these ideas and locate these ideas, um, you know, in, in a specific context. But you're you're absolutely right that um, this a lot so much more of the 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 stuff that is happening inside the the model itself is really unrelated to to narratives uh, in a large to, to a large effect, and so. Uh, we we're we're taking your advice, and we're we're going to be uh, essentially deconstructing some of how we're positioning this paper, um, and and trying to think more carefully about locating this within the idea of kind of field organizing and market organizing and positioning within those markets um, as a, as a way to kind of locate the locate the piece. But but thank you thank you for confirming our suspicions here, Dan uh, and Gary. You have a hand as well. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I'm um, trying to integrate both what you're saying and, and I appreciated Dan's comment about the kind of temporal dimension and, and yeah. really kind of wrestling with that. And I was wondering if these concepts of hype operate when there are high degrees of uncertainty um, versus do they operate um, in another context in a similar way? So is there some sort of interaction between uncertainty or is it really about like again, the chart that you uh, shared earlier, the Ganter chart of kind of uh, as you know the the bubble sort of you know kind of structure. Yeah, it's a it's a really it's a really interesting question um, to think about uncertainty. You know, uncertainty as a potential boundary condition here, um, or or even potentially, I mean, even more so as some kind of mechanism that's that's driving the hype itself. Um, I, I I think you know absolutely there you know to the extent that we're we're 
discussing kind of bold future predictions that, that relate to some kind of collective vision. To the extent that hype is related to these collective visions of the future, um, the, and, and to the extent that that is driving um, cultural interest, there does seem to be a, a, a need to think about that in the context of high uncertainty. There, there has to be some degree to which these are, these are viewed as both highly desirable, but questionably feasible outcomes, right? There's, there's some degree to which we, we, we view these, these collective visions as some, something that we're all very interested in achieving, either, either in terms of the solution itself or in terms of some outcome associated with that solution, but then a high degree of risk and, um, and potentially uncertainty uh, associated with that, that comes into, that, that affects the feasibility of pulling this off. So yeah, yeah, good, great question. Thanks, Gary. Um, any other thoughts or questions here? Uh, I guess I'll, I'll move forward. I know we're, we've got only 13 minutes left. So, so we're trying to um, ultimately pull this into the, again, the, this idea of a sustained opportunity for some sort of social impact. And you know, here, again, we're referring to the degree to which the opportunity for social impact was realized. Um, so I wanna just kind of show you the differences that we observed here. And as you look at London, London very early on actually got David Cameron, the, the former prime minister, involved in, in sort of driving this initiative, right? So, so talk, about, talk about how to mobilize hype, right? Let's get the prime minister involved in celebrating this effort, right? And, and, and you know, this can be distinguished from the way that Toronto played it, right? The, the founder actually downplayed the hype around the platform itself admitting to feeling a bit of discomfort, discomfort describing their work as a global first, right? So there's always a reticence to kind of, there was an acknowledgement that, that high truly was this kind of precarious sort of resource and, and they had to be careful about how they mobilized it. Um, again, you know, this compared with Singapore where the founders considered that a social stock exchange is the pinnacle of a transformed financial system. And you know they're, they were really trying to position themselves as the forthcoming global leader in this field. So whereas Toronto was situating themselves locally, um, Singapore was positioning themselves globally very much. Um, here, in terms of the platform organizing, one of the one of the key distinctions here, again, I mentioned this earlier, was in how they how they tried to organize exchange by way of defining, by, by way of clarifying how they were measuring impact. For those of you that are, are familiar with this kind of impact investing space, you'll know that this is really one of the key problems in driving adoption, right? How, how you determine what social impact is and what qualifies as social impact in one venture or another is such an important part for orchestrating exchange. And so the, here there were very distinct approaches. So whereas um, in the case of London, they, they decentralized the authentication of impact measurement to participants. They, London basically said, this is too hard of a problem to, to centralize. We are going to allow you to adopt whatever type of approach you think is most useful. And you just have to justify that to us in order. And so you ultimately there, there ended up being a lot of divergent models of impact being used at the time uh, on the platform. So uh, second, uh, in terms of the, um, the Toronto exchange, what they did was they partnered with B Lab. So Christine mentioned that I, I, did, I, I, I do a lot of work in the area of B corporations. B Lab is the organization that drives a lot of that effort globally around B Corp certifications and benefit corporation legislation around the world. And so for Toronto, they saw this as an opportunity to connect in with a, an increasingly legitimate player within the field that has orchestrated a way to, ma to manage and measure impact in this space. Um, Singapore alternatively centralized a lot of these efforts. So they said, we are going to come up with the standard and how to measure this. 
and we're going to be responsible for this. The way that this was organized in terms of the ecosystem was also very different. So um, London positioned itself, they wanted to be essentially become a one-stop shop, this kind of ad hoc approach to market building. Whenever somebody would approach them, they would connect. And so it was, it was, they were orchestrating a lot of weak ties within the field. Um, on the other hand, the, the Toronto Exchange uh, tried to co-create the field. So they, they, they started to build this community and they, they, they wanted everyone to know each other. So they were trying to orchestrate strong ties within the whole community locally around this effort. Um, uh, again, contrasting with Singapore's efforts, there was an effort to, to sort of control the network positioning themselves centrally and then creating structural holes. And therefore they would facilitate connections, but they were always, they always wanted to maintain a central and dominant space within that network. So ultimately, how did these differences make a difference? Um, ultimately, as we think about bringing this back around to the entrepreneurial runways, what we're trying to show here is that these mattered in terms of both the impact flexibility and the categorical flexibility. And so in the case of the London Social Stock Exchange, what, what we observed is that there was this essentially diminished impact. So they, they were required, I mean, as you can see in this first quote here, they, they needed proof points. Their stakeholders were demanding that they show them evidence of impact and, or else they weren't going to get any additional funding. So the engagement was declining and they needed to see evidence of impact. In addition, there was, no, there was no allowance. There were no relational affordances here in terms of the, the ability for this organization to pivot to something new. As they tried to, as they tried to change the model around, there was, they felt the categorical imperative coming back around and pushing them back into this kind of model. So they couldn't pivot and they couldn't show evidence, and therefore they ultimately collapsed. They shut down their efforts in 2018, and ultimately they very quietly did it. They just kind of stepped back. They had they actually had to launch a kick uh, like a Kickstarter campaign to try to crowdfund this at some point in time. It just it just it, nothing was working. Uh, on the other hand, the 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 Toronto Exchange here this was interesting because again the kind of systematic efforts to build capacity and build relational affordances essentially allowed them to um, ex expand and enter into, enter into new markets. They're increasingly engaged in uh, white labeling their, their platform globally. So they're, they're making steady progress toward this goal of creating a, uh, a functioning social stock exchange. And then, alternatively, um, what we observed with what we observed with uh, the Singaporean exchange is that there was a, a high degree of categorical flexibility because of their centralized position. They, they they sort of dominated the conversation, but at the same time, they 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 needed to demonstrate impact. Um, and so, so what they ended up doing was they ended up shifting to something that they could they could achieve real like um they could achieve progress on immediately so they couldn't push they couldn't push the deadline out any further in order to sustain the engagement they had to execute and show proof points early on so you know and a, and a, you, as you can see here um there's there's some unobserved here i mean i do wonder whether many nonprofits actually fit into this model where there's there's low categorical flexibility but a high degree of impact flexibility. There's a degree to which, you know, th there, uh, you know, nonprofits can delay the extent to which they're having to show clear evidence of impact. But at the same time, there's there are clear demands for nonprofits to be authentic, right? To be authentically uh, characteristic to their specific missions, and so their their capacity to deviate from those becomes suspect. Um, I, there's there's some con, you know I, I can talk about how this relates to how this uh, relates back to existing theory and makes contributions, but we only have four minutes left, and and ultimately you know as I noted 
we're deconstructing this at the point at, at this point anyways. And so how we're positioning this in relation to the existing literature is shifting as we speak. And so, you know, rather than do that, why don't I just take the opportunity to open up to any last questions that you have or feedback that you have, things that we're missing um, or, or comments. I, I, I welcome your thoughts. I'll say something just because you're thinking about existing literatures. It strikes me that there's a really interesting um, parallel here to the policy streams process that we talk a lot about in public policy research. I'm thinking about the creation of opportunity windows and how to maximize those um, and how it requires the convergence of these different factors, but with a very different context. So if it helps. Super, super, super interesting. interesting. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. By the way, jo Giovanna, is, is there a key citation that, that comes to mind there? Um, John Kingdon, 1984. Perfect. Thank you. The case itself is super interesting, like the comparison across the three. Um, but I think that's, in my mind, more interesting than the, the, <laughs> than the, the, than the cultural entrepreneurship and all of that. You know, I, I get you yeah. trying to position it. Um, and so trying to yeah. get more into that. Right. So it's the takeaway. Right. So from a structure perspective, it feels like the, the Toronto had some sort of intermediate co-construction of, of structure. Right. They, they had the third party certification, but they weren't they weren't controlling it, but they weren't just letting it go. And then from a collaboration perspective, you've got this, um, again, sort of this intermediate. Right. I'm not controlling it. And I, so a bit. What do, what do you want to take away just sort of conceptually from like what, what we learn about this comparison sort of, a, and not conceptually like theoretically, but just like, what do we learn about, yeah, about yeah. The, these three different organizing efforts? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent question. Yeah. I mean, I, the, what I, what I see is I think, as I think about these different cases and why, why did Toronto, why has Toronto been successful in sort of mobilizing and sort of navigating this precarity? Whereas the other two have sort of, um, in, in different ways, kind of fa fallen prey to the the hype, um, and I, 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 my my sense is that there's something about the 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 kind of systematic co-creation of of infrastructure around uh, you know bringing inviting the network into the process that is that is key to, to creating these kinds of relational affordances or entrepreneurial discretion that is necessary in the context of uncertainty that Gary was, you know, report, was, was talking about. You know, in the, in the middle of this high degree of uncertainty, you need impact flexibility. You need some categorical flexibility. And, and, and hype, unfortunately, doesn't give you that. Hype actually locks you in. And, and you, so in order, to, in order to build that, you, you have to create space and that space requires relationships. And, and so that kind of relational work, I think is, 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 is sort of the, the key takeaway for me. And hopefully, hopefully that was clear to you as well as, as I was talking about some of these differences. Terrific, I find that a really helpful um, sort of summary. Violina, it looked like you might wanna Jump in. I, we have an, we're out of time, but I'll give, give you the last question. Hi, 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 I'm sorry. I just got the tail end of it, but I think the uncertainty angle is very interesting. Obviously, that's salient to me, just kind of this notion of a semi-structure or intermediate structure, because I don't think you're really talking about a curvilinear relationship, but a different right. mechanism that balance structure and flexibility. So very cool. I would love to see the paper. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Violina. I appreciate your comment so much. Thanks. All right, so I will close us off. Um, if, 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 if we're willing to, if there's last questions, stick around uh, for, for a minute or two. It's, it's late in uh, at Cambridge, so I don't want to keep Matthew too long. But uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I look forward uh, to seeing you again at a, an, another talk. Um, so thank you so much for sharing sharing this work. Yeah, and thank, thank you for having me.